is Christian Gillison. He is also one of these young successful scientists at the Department of Human Genetics at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen. He is a principal investigator there and associate professor and his research group is on genome bioinformatics. We are happy that you will present here today, Christian, and uh, I ask you to share your screen okay. and to enter the stage to give your presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak. Uh, as I said, uh, with the concert of last night, this is actually the most fun conference of the entire year. Um, so I'm really enjoying it already. And I'm very happy to be in this uh, session with, with two of my friends, Malt and, uh, and Alex. Uh, I actually took a picture of the program to, to show people uh, that we're all in the same session. Um, and on the matter of the Dutch set session, I think Nijmegen is only two kilometers from the German border. So you, know, you might as well count it as Germany. All right, so um, today I'll talk about the novel mutations in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So uh, we've been very interested in the novel mutations already for uh, several years. We've been uh, studying them. Um, and, and one thing that I wanted to just mention is that we've actually also studied them in healthy individuals. And this work was done by a, a German PhD student, Jakob Goldman, uh, for many years uh, um, with some very interesting findings. Um, but uh, today I'll not talk about that. I'll actually talk about the work that we've done on using de novo mutations to identify disease genes for neurodevelopmental disorders, or in our case, specifically intellectual disability, and by using large-scale exome tree sequencing uh, data. So as Peter introduced me, I, uh, I'm a bioinformatician. And so um, yeah, we do data analysis and preferably large-scale. Okay, um, so a little bit of background on the novel mutations. I assume most people will know, but uh, uh, the novel mutations are new mutations that arise in the gametes. Um, and um, well, you can see you get two uh, chromosomes, um, one from your father, one from your mother. So all of your DNA comes from your parents, except for these de novo mutations. Um, and they, thereby they are the source actually of genome evolution, genetic diversity, uh, but unfortunately also a cause of genetic disease. And you get around 30 to 90 per individual um, genome, which boils down to, let's say, one or two, zero to two in the, in the coding sequences. Um, and we already know from, from previous work that these de novo mutations are also actually a quite important cause of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders such as intellectual disability. Now, this story starts several years ago where uh, we already performed routine exome sequencing diagnostics for patients with intellectual disability. And we did this in a trio approach because we also then knew that the novo mutations are an important cause. And so we sequence all three. And at this time we sequence approximately 1500 trios. But what we noticed that is that um, when the molecular geneticist interprets the data, he does it in isolation. He looks at a single patient, looks at the data and there, and, and because he looks at them one by one, it might happen that he may find a de novo mutation in a gene uh, that is so far uh, unknown, uh, and he will classify it as not relevant for the disease. And then three months later, he might find, have a different patient with a similar mutation in the same gene uh, and not remember that he's seen this previously. Um, so our question here was, you know, is it possible to actually identify new genes by looking at all of these samples at the same time. So performing a, a cohort analysis. Um, so we, we tried to collect our cohort um, from the 1500 patients, uh, 820 were eligible, mostly because of the need for proper informed consent. Um, and you know, we, we used all of the data for the de novo mutations uh, to get about a thousand for 820 individuals. So that's 1.3 coding de novo mutations per individual. It's a little bit on the low side. Uh, we, nowadays we hope for 1.4, 1.5, but it's quite, quite okay. You can see the distribution. It's good to realize that there's actually also a significant fraction of individuals, patients that do not have any de novo mutations. 
Um, so um, our first question was, we have this cohort now, can we actually see whether there's anything meaningful in there? Can we, we, can we somehow quantify the fact that these are patients rather than healthy individuals? So what we look for is, um, what is the number of genes with recurrent de novo mutations? Um, first, we took a cohort of healthy controls. Um, and you can see here the distribution of what you would expect in terms of recurrent genes. Um, and then this is what we actually observed in this cohort of healthy controls. Um, we see almost exactly what we would expect based on the distribution, uh, approximately three, two to three uh, recurrent loss of function mutations in the uh, healthy individuals. So now if we actually look at our own cohort, we can uh, make a similar distribution of expectation. Uh, but in this case, you can see that the number of recurrent loss of function mutations in the, uh, our cohort is much higher than we expect uh, by chance. So clearly showing that there is uh, interesting things to find in, in this cohort. So how do we do this then? Um, we use a, uh, an approach based on gene-specific mutation rates um, to determine the probability of identifying recurrent de novo mutations in the cohort. Um, and recurrent, I, I mean recurrent within the same gene. Uh, so the principle is actually yeah, rather straightforward. Uh, we, we take the genome-wide mutation rate, uh, we look at the size of the gene, and then we say, okay, if we have this many de novo mutations in the genome, how many will we have in this gene? And then we correct for sequence contracts and for um, a little bit for, for uh, evolutionary indicators of uh, increased or decreased uh, mutation rates. And we can do that in a gene-specific manner. For, so for each gene, we can actually calculate how many de novo mutations do we expect to find in a cohort of healthy individuals and then compare that to what we find in our cohort of patients. Um, so we categorize the mutations for this because we have different probabilities for the different types of mutations. Uh, we categorize them into two categories, uh, truncating and functional mutations, but truncating basically means loss of function and functional is the loss of function uh, with an addition of missense and in-frame uh, in insertions and deletions. Um, so the question in, in the end is for which genes do we have more of these mutations in, uh, in the cohort than we expect? So the first thing that we can do is look at known genes. So if we just run against the entire uh, uh, cohort or even if we only run against the diagnosed patients, we can see that uh, the method by itself worked quite well. Uh, we identify 18 known genes as top candidates uh, in the cohort um, without any kinds of uh, strange artifacts. So this shows that the, the, the method in itself works. So, um, but we do realize that we are a little bit underpowered with 820 trios, even though you might think that's a lot. Uh, so to achieve the best possible power, we actually add published cohorts uh, to our own cohort. And in particular, I think the, the DDD study was a large cohort that we could simply add in, and then we get 2,100 trios that we can look at. Now, to increase our power a little bit more, we remove all of the uh, patients with a known, uh, with a de novo mutation in a known gene. Um, and then what we have left is about 1,500 trios um, without such a de novo mutation in which we can look for new genes. And then yeah, we apply our basic statistical model, uh, which is a Poisson-based model, um, and what we get is uh, a list or ranking of 10 genes for which either functional mutations in green or loss of function mutations in blue uh, pass a significant threshold, uh, meaning that these have significantly more de novo mutations in our patient core than we would expect by chance. Yeah. And with that also, we actually achieve 90 novel diagnoses. Uh, so this is very nice, uh, but I'll, I'll give you one example to make it a little bit more concrete. I think this one is very nice. It's uh, mutations in TLK2. Um, so you can see uh, that the, the protein function is actually not something that you would maybe associate with intellectual disability genes, maybe regulation of chromatin assembly by now. Uh, but, but the nice part is that um, we have three mutations in the DDD cohort and two mutations in the, our own cohort. So each of the uh, studies themselves would not have been able to identify this gene uh, uh, as associated with intellectual disability. Um, but only combined do we get the power that we need um, to find it. Um, a nice thing is we have two patients uh, from our own center, so we can actually look at the phenotypes of these patients. 
Um, so both have mild ID, several severe behavioral problems and constipation. So that is a little bit remarkable, but very nicely also, if we ask a clinical geneticist to look at the uh, faces of the two patients, then they do recognize specific facial dysmorphisms uh, that, that you know, separate them a little bit from the other patients, uh, namely narrow palpebral fissures, high nasal bridge and small upper lip and small chin. So these are uh, relatively specific features for these two uh, patients, thereby confirming that indeed probably TLK, TLK2 is uh, a, a gene that causes intellectual disability. Okay, so one thing that we noticed while doing this analysis is that sometimes we identify mutation clusters. So this was one of the genes that we uh, identified, uh, one of the known genes. And what you, what you can see here in, in blue is indicate the location of the de novo mutation on the cDNA. Um, and you can clearly see that, you know, five out of the six mutations, uh, they cluster very closely together. So then we wondered, okay, can we use this fact actually to identify novel genes as well? Um, just not by looking by the number of mutations, but looking at their spatial distribution across the gene. So how do we do this? Um, we identify, we uh, make up a, a distance measure, a clustering metric, let's say, and we do that by calculating the geometric mean of the distances on the cDNA of all of the mutations. And then we do permutations. Basically, we randomly distribute the same number of mutations across the gene, uh, generate the distribution for that, and then ask ourselves the question, you know, is the, the, the real uh, mutation distribution very different from what we, uh, is the real uh, distance between the mutations different from what we uh, expect based on the distribution? Uh, and in this way, we generate a, a statistical p-value. Um, um, so if we do this, we find um, uh, 15 genes that are significant, show significant clustering, of which 12 of them are actually known um, genes for intellectual disability or developmental disorders. Um, just to show you two examples, one is PAX1, a gene that we know very well. Uh, it has nine de novo mutations, all at exactly the same position. So this was obviously our, our top hit in the analysis. Another gene that pops out is SMART4, or Myers syndrome, where all of the mutations cluster in a specific domain. And actually we know already from literature that this is indeed the way uh, that, that mutations occur in patients. Uh, these are gain of function mutations. So this just shows that our method is, is working successfully. Uh, now we also identify three novel candidate genes. Um, and as you can see uh, from, from these pictures and the mutations, all of the mutations that we find are a maximum of three mutations and they cluster exactly on the same position. So this just indicates that we're you know, at the borderline of our uh, uh, statistical power. We, we really don't have that many patients to do this analysis. So we can only find uh, statistical significance if we have exactly three mutations on the same position. Um, but, um, well, these are very good candidates, especially you will recognize PAX2. Uh, which of course uh, is uh, related to the gene PAX1. Okay, so how can we look at these genes further to see if they really are associated with intellectual disability? Is there something else that we can do? Um, so we thought of the fact that, you know, mostly we look at genes that are haploinsufficient. So in that case, the mutations, they are spread out throughout the gene uh, like this, because it doesn't really matter where you have the mutation as long as it disrupts the gene function. Um, but these genes, uh, they are characterized by, by clustering and therefore we, we expect that um, the mechanism behind them is maybe a gain of function or dominant negative uh, effect. Uh, so can we find characteristics of non insufficiency mechanisms in these 15 genes that we found? Um, so what we came up with is actually looking at um, 3D protein structures. So the idea is that um, for haploinsufficient genes, we know that missense mutations quite often, they disrupt the folding of the protein. And that's because they happen within the core structure of the protein. So when they happen in the, in the, in the core, uh, the protein uh, cannot fold properly. Uh, and therefore you get a, a similar effect as haploinsufficiency. Now for missense mutations that happen in, in, for genes that are not haploinsufficient, we expect the genes, the, the mutations to be uh, also clustered very closely together, but on the surface of the protein, uh, impacting interactions. 
Um, so I'll show you two examples of what that might, what that looks like for known genes. So this is uh, GN, GNAI1. Uh, this is a haploinsufficient gene. These are the de novo mutations in this gene. You can see that all of these mutations, they happen within the core of the uh, protein. And therefore we suspect they, they prohibit proper folding uh, and disrupt uh, the entire protein. Uh, however, if you look at a different gene, PPP2R5D, for which we know that it, uh, mutations in this gene, uh, this gene is not a haploinsufficient gene, we can see that indeed the mutations, they all cluster in a very specific region of the protein uh, on the outside, uh, and probably you know, impacting some kind of interaction of this protein. So can we quantify that then for our own genes? Um, here we looked and we categorized all of the mutations into three categories, uh, buried, semi-buried, or surface. And we looked at 25 haploinsufficient genes and 75 in all mutations. You can see the distribution. Uh, let's say roughly one third of the mutations occurs at the surface uh, and two thirds occurs either buried or semi-buried. If we now look at our 10 genes that we've identified, of which we believe that the mechanism is not haploinsufficiency, we can see that the distribution is uh, markedly different. Almost two thirds of the mutations actually occur at the surface of the protein. And uh, we can quantify this, and this is statistically significant difference. So they were showing that indeed, probably that by identifying um, genes based on the clustering of mutations, we're identifying genes that do not act through a mechanism of haploinsufficiency. So, you know, this, this worked really well, and, and, and many of these genes have by now been confirmed in separate study to be um, genes that are involved in neurodevelopmental disorders. The question is, can we do better um, than this? And uh, yeah, there's two options for doing that. That is either by using larger cohorts or by using better methods. Um, so um, we decided to collaborate um, with uh, one, the DDD, and uh, with a diagnostic testing company in the US, uh, GeneDX. And we decided to pool all of the data that we have together. Now, since we're talking about the novel mutations, that's actually not uh, an enormous effort in terms of the amount of data um, but the numbers are quite impressive. We managed to collect about 31,000 trios with 45,000 novel mutations. So um, I'm showing you this slide. This is about combining and comparing the data because um, we spent, I think, roughly two thirds of the project time on actually combining and comparing the data to make sure that all of the data is, is correct and that we don't have any artifacts because we have done these experiments at different centers. So we perform quality filtering, uh, we um, correct for coverage biases, we remove duplicate samples in our cohorts by looking for 50 common SNPs, uh, removing siblings, and removing false positive variants based on spurious enrichment. So um, what we, for example, find is that in the raw data, if we analyze it, we'll find genes to be significant in one of the cohorts, but not in any of the two other cohorts. So this took most of the time, but then in the end, you have a very nice cohort. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, we have about a little bit more than half of the individuals that we have are, uh, have are male, and that's consistent across the three cohorts. And we can see that the, in terms of mutations, um, also there we're quite similar. Um, we have similar numbers of synonymous mutations, which are not more than we would expect in a cohort of healthy individuals. Uh, we have a similar enrichment for missense and loss of function mutations across all of the three separate cohorts. So uh, that's the, the data part now on the improved method. Um, we can also do that. We developed a new method uh, based on simulations and uh, incorporating variant and gene level weights. Um, so for example, you can, you can think of this as um, usually when you identify a gene um, that you think is a new dominant gene for intellectual disability, you will go to GNOMAD, look up whether it is uh, intolerant for loss of function mutations. And then if it is, you think that is additional proof of the fact that the gene might be relevant. So you can also incorporate these kinds of uh, metrics into your algorithm itself. And that is what we did here. We developed an algorithm called the Novo West. Um, and we compared it to the original algorithm based on the gene specific mutation rates. Um, and what it boils down to is that um, we are more sensitive with the Novo West. We identify 18 more genes in this cohort than uh, based on the old method. And that is not a 
enormous improvement, uh, but it is uh, some improvement. So I think uh, if you look at this study, um, uh, we got most of the additional gain from the larger cohort rather from the improved method. Um, so what do we um, what do we see if we run the method? What do we find? Uh, these are the uh, different categories of genes. So we have genes that are novel, so never before associated with neurodevelopmental disorder. We have genes that are discordant, meaning that one of the centers, uh, or at least one of them, has classified this as a uh, intellectual disability gene, but not all of them. And then we have consensus. These are genes that we all agree upon are uh, genuine neurodevelopmental genes. Um, so if we then look at um, the, the distribution of p-values, you can see that the most significant genes that we find, the vast majority of them are actually consensus genes, uh, genes that we already know. And if we look at the other spectrum, if we look at the ones that are barely significant, so these are uncorrected p-values, uh, you can see that here we identify many more discordant and novel genes than we do for the, for the very significant ones. So yeah, you can see that, that this really shows that uh, the additional uh, number of patients that we're using is helping us out. So we also identify 28 novel genes and we do that by rerunning the algorithm, but then only on individuals that do not have a non-synonymous mutation in one of the consensus genes. Um, here you can see the 28 genes and they're, they're actually colored by their uh, enrichment on the y-axis, the number of protein truncating variants, so loss of function mutation, and on the x-axis, the number of missense and novel mutations. Um, I will highlight one of these, which is actually quite nice, PSM PSMC5, um, which is significant, uh, not because of the number of missense mutations, but rather because of the clustering of missense mutations, you can see it very clearly down, down here. Eight mutations are clustered on, on two positions. Um, and so this, is, this metric is also incorporated in the, uh, in the algorithm. Okay, now looking at overall, so what, what do we find if we look at neurodevelopmentals as a whole? Uh, so on the left, you can see a, a graph that, that um, indicates the entire uh, population of uh, neurodevelopmental disorder cases. Uh, we know that approximately 50% of these we should be able to explain uh, because of the novel mutations. Um, and of these 50% in our study, we're able to explain roughly half of them uh, with the consensus known, discordant, and the novel. Um, Moreover, uh, if you look at the, the, um, how many individuals uh, we find um, that have a mutation in the novel genes, that's 314, that's roughly 1% of the cohort uh, that we additionally diagnose based on the new genes. Okay, then finally, um, yeah, we asked the question, are we then now uh, you know, reaching the end of our gene discovery? Uh, for that, we downsampled the cohort. Um, into smaller uh, sets of, of patients. And you can see by the curve that uh, we're not flattening out. We have not reached a plateau for the number of significant genes. Uh, there are still many genes to find. Um, so to summarize, um, we improved our statistical framework to identify uh, genes enriched for the novel mutations. We used it on a data set of uh, 31,000 patients and identified 28 genes that are novel. Um, based on the analysis, and I didn't show you all of this, um, the remaining burden in, is likely spread across approximately a thousand genes. And most importantly, we can see from our data that these genes probably have reduced penetrance. Um, that will make them more difficult to identify. And therefore, unfortunately, even larger cohorts will be needed um, to identify these remaining genes and data sharing will be actually essential. So with that, I'm at the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. So as I said, this work was in collaboration with uh, the DDD, the group of Matt Halls, especially Joanna Kaplanis and Caitlin Samorka did a great deal there, uh, but also GeneDX uh, led by Kyle Retter and on our side, this work was done by Stefan Lelyfeld and Lavos van der Wiel. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for this nice presentation. There are two questions already in the chat and I will read them. One is from Alexei Knaus. He asks, with strict de novo filters, one might even filter out frequent de novo mutations in a gene. When you find it several, uh, 
find it several patients with a broad phenotypic spectrum such as ID or, or developmental delay. How do you know that this clustering of mutations is not a clustering of founder mutation or a rather less common variant without clinical significance? Yeah, so uh, that's a nice question. So the, the, the way that we gather the novel, the novel mutations is very strict. We actually inspected many of them manually. So we know that the, the novel mutations are true. Um, so when we look at the clustering, um, we do know that these are genuine de novo mutations that cluster and we can reproduce some of the known genes or known clustering sites uh, with that. So that's why we're, we're pretty confident that, well, we know that, it's, that it, this is okay and we are not afraid of actually having spurious clustering because of um, rare variants that we detected that are actually not de novo. So I think everything in this study that we've done has etched on the safe side. So we've been very, very careful to make sure that each and every single mutation is correct and that each of the genes that we identified is indeed a, a novel gene. Um, yeah, and I, I could explain much more about why we did that and how other studies have not done that, but I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, you can continue the discussion in the question and answer room. Uh, next question is from Maria Bukhari. She asked, for selecting a candidate, how much do you rely on pathogenicity scores provided by different prediction tools such as CAD and or Proven? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, actually, well, we sort of don't, but we also do a little bit. So in the end, when we have the genes, these are purely identified based on their statistical significance. So without really looking at any of these prediction tools, however, the model that we use, the weights that we assign to variants, we do use CAT for that. So the, the, the weights in the algorithm are based on CAT. Um, but in the end, when we have the genes, uh, these are just the genes and we don't, do any, we don't need to do any further investigation into uh, prediction tools. Okay, the last question comes from Uwe Kornack. He asks, among the gene products affected by non haplotype and suf uh, insufficiency mutations, do you find an over-representation of multimeric proteins as a basis for a dominant negative effect? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, we should have looked at that, but we haven't. Uh, but that is a, indeed a very good way of, of, uh, of looking at it as well. We didn't do it at that time. And I'm pretty sure there, I'm pretty sure there is, because we know that some of the individuals, one, I know that they are multimeric proteins. But we could have used this as well to show that we're, uh, we have an overrepresentation of those. Yeah. Okay. Then thank you once again, Christian. And we move.